Good morning, everyone. I'm Joan Thompson from Group ASI, and I want to welcome you to the AWP University presentation of 10 Things Organizations Screw Up in AWP. Your speaker is Robin Mickelson. Enjoy the session. Thank you very much, Joan, for the introduction. Again, my name is Robin Mickelson. Um, I am the president of the AWP University. Uh, we are an organization that specializes in uh, advanced work packaging and workface planning training. Uh, we've got uh, many instructors that are considered leading SMEs within the industry. Um, we have been developing our curriculum now going on about 15 years. Um, in that 15 years, I have been working as a uh, consultant for AWP and workface planning, as well as training all over the world. Um, and the AWP University has been formally uh, formed actually about a year ago now with the purpose of uh, developing um, LMS and online training, as well as in-person instructor-led training. Uh, I think Joan's putting a pamphlet in the downloadables for you, uh, which is actually some of our upcoming courses that we're co-delivering um, and partnering with ASI for, uh, for the delivery of, um, which is a great opportunity. There's actually a UK course that's coming at the end of next week for AWP and engineering, uh, if you're interested. All right, so let's jump into it. So today we are going to uh, talk about a few things, but the biggest thing is um, we're going to talk about the 10 things organizations screw up in AWP. Um, when it comes to, to planning and executing of AWP, uh, there tends to be a couple things that, that people overlook and just from many, many years of executing AWP on over 100 projects now, I've kind of noticed a couple things that are fairly typical. Um, when it comes down, so some of these are a little tongue in cheek, but, and we're going to keep it positive and, and uh, go through some of these typical items. So top 10 things. So the first one, let's look. So first one is fail to use short interval production control. Now, what the heck is short interval production control? Often within the advanced work packaging, work phase planning world, we tend to forget that there's life beyond IWP. Um, and what I mean by life beyond IWP is that just the IWP itself is not the end of the planning activity. Um, that, that craft task grouping is maybe dropped down to that 600 to 1,000 hours, somewhere in their type range, um, or whatever makes sense as we're working on a new definition for the IWP type and size. Um, but the truth is, is that there's a lot of craft planning that has to happen below that level and in properly bringing forward our craft to be able to identify both the prerequisite work, uh, requirements, the constraints and stuff, doing the constraint removals at the field level. Um, work phase planning and advanced work packaging has a very strong uh, uh, constraint removal basics around previous to release of the IWP. Um, but when we get into the field, there's also field constraints that pop up that we need to continue, continue to do. Uh, putting uh, constraints or putting people in place and the resources required um, you know, that field level planning, getting resource management and stuff in place is extremely important uh, for ensuring that our IWPs uh, get to get out, um, not just effectively, but are efficiently utilized within the field. Um, and that those handoff requirements between the different IWPs from one IWP to another are well executed. And then each activity within them are released. Um, so time, inventory, capacity, making sure that you're looking at that. These are a little bit more lean type uh, construction activities, but um, very, very apt to the way that we execute work phase planning and advanced work packaging in the field. And it's amazing how many times organizations will forget um, that at that industry, at that, at, at that construction level, we need to plan um, within the IWP execution itself. And we need to teach our foreman and general foreman how to build those daily work plans and how to nest those IWPs, if you will, um, so that those IWPs actually um, work in consort with each other as they're, they're being executed within the field. All right, so this is just a picture of a couple of the different types of um, planning activities. These are actually pictures taken from um, a consultation we did on a hospital project um, and the daily scrums in the morning for the daily planning activities. Um, identifying IWPs and work phase planning as a true pull type activity rather than a push activity is extremely important. Uh, it's another area within short interval production control that some organizations get lost where they start pushing IWPs to the field. 
um, to be executed rather than working with the IWPs in a pull fashion uh, based on the plans and, and execution of the foreman within the range of that level three schedule activity, if you will. Uh, bringing forward that pull type basis is extremely important in that short interval production control action. All right, so with this, of course, as we're gonna go through these, I'll tie them all to offerings that, that the AWP University has. Um, so when it comes to short interval production control, we have AWP 315, which is one of our courses um, to help you learn about uh, um, the aspects of planning beyond the IWP in the field level. <clears throat> All right, so number nine, don't integrate AWP into contracts in the bid process. You think that's that's probably a fairly obvious one. Unfortunately, it's a pretty regular uh, occurring issue um, in the field when we start to audit and start to look at a lot of projects. You know, when we get into it and they, they get through this basis of, well, the, the suppliers know what they need to give us. Um, we'll contract them, we've worked with them before and it'll be all great. Unfortunately, the little cartoon in the, the bottom left corner here uh, rings truer than normal, uh, where you have certain expectations, but uh, the reality is something uh, outside of what you expected. Uh, contracting requirements, templates, expectations of your AWP guidelines and requirements um, are a paramount activity, and it's amazing how many contracts um, are devoid and miss the, the whole AWP workface planning requirements. and. When I say requirements, I'm speaking not just on the planning activities, if you will, but I'm also speaking on the basis of data requirements. Uh, yesterday through the technology discussions, we had a lot of great discussions about data requirements and data, how it needs to be transferred, um, the, the data group with the, data, the new data requirements that have been developed within CII, a lot of really great information, those data requirements from CII that were being presented yesterday are literally just about a contract inclusion in themselves. Um, so many templates, so many great things, making sure that your contracts are not just written from a thou shalt point of view, but also uh, how you need to deliver information, making sure that you get it in the, in the fashion that you're expecting. All right, uh, from that point of view, when we start talking contract language, um, AWP 404, uh, within the university is a great course on teaching you about court contract language and bringing forward uh, those types of issues. Um, now, just in case I, uh, I get cut off uh, during this session, I'll give you a, a brief warning. Um, I'm actually located um, in uh, Western Canada, uh, just south of Calgary in the Rocky Mountain foothills. And uh, we're in the middle of a pretty good spring storm here right now. The wind is blowing and it looks like an ice storm outside and my lights have been flickering here kind of all morning. So if I suddenly get cut off, I, I apologize, but there's a very good chance that I could just suddenly lose power here this morning because they've been flickering a little bit. So uh, just as a, as a side note, just to give you a little bit of a pre-warning. All right, so let's jump to our number eight. Identify correct AWP requirements for the size of a project. Um, scaling AWP is a um, strong, strong task and a strong skill that needs to be brought forward um, into AWP organizations so that you understand that, you know, not all sizes fit all um, and that when you bring it forward, there needs to be a basis of how do we implement AWP on a very small project or how do we implement it on a very large project? Um, COA in consort with several CII members also created this report um, on scalability of advanced work packaging. Uh, if you scan the code on the screen here, it'll actually take you right to the COA website uh, to a place where you can actually download the scalability report that's free to everyone uh, to download. And it's a great report on scaling AWP. It's probably one of the biggest questions that we often get in, uh, in the implementations of AWP is, yeah, I can see it being put on a giga project, but can we really bring it forward to a small maintenance shutdown type project? Uh, the answer to that's uh, very much absolutely you can. Uh, and the basis of workface planning and advanced work packaging to start with really actually came from uh, the uh, uh, re retrofitting, if you will, of, uh, of the, uh, planning activities within shutdown and maintenance type planning. Uh, so it's a natural fit for those smaller projects as well as the large mega and giga projects. 
Uh, this report takes you through a lot of that. Great resource. Um, I suggest you, you have a look at it to help you classify your projects. One of the ways that that scalability report helps you to classify the projects is by identifying and categorizing it and then giving you a set of uh, items that you should consider um, for that type of a, of a project. Uh, by categorizing it based on unfamiliar and the level of uh, the familiarity and the level of complexity, uh, there's a certain amount of, uh, of risk that needs to be identified. And from that, you can, you can start to build uh, the basis of maybe how we need to scale AWP to make it sense for make sense for an organization. So it's a very good report to help you go through. So whether you're looking at large projects, a small project, like just a fence install, um, that scalability is a great tool. Uh, we have a course, AWP 501, that teaches you about that scalability tool, teaches you about how to scale your AWP implementation. You know, maybe on a giga project, you've got a very large department, and maybe on that maintenance shutdown, you've got a much smaller pro smaller program, or maybe you've got a heavy prog programmatic approach where your projects may never be more than, say, $5 million each, but you've got a portfolio that you're managing upwards of a billion dollars because you've got a lot of small projects. Uh, the scalability um, aspects and tools um, and that report from COA will definitely help you uh, get a handle on that and bring it forward. Uh, it's a great tool. Um, I felt felt it necessary to bring it forward. It's it's one of the very obvious top 10 questions that we receive uh, when it comes to implementation of AWP is, yeah, but for what size of project? Um, and this tool really does help you, you gauge that and move forward with it. All right. <clears throat> so number seven, fail to track AWP metrics. Um, we love tracking metrics on projects. We love getting involved with project controls and we love bringing forward um, all kinds of reports, but if you don't integrate your AWP activities um, into that basis, it's very quick that you can lose control of the, the actual AWP program itself or not have a great view into just exactly how well it's doing. But more so than just guiding yourself on how well are we doing or what's actually happening during our implementation is being able to identify the benefits of AWP and how well um, you're actually performing and how much the cost savings or how well uh, your productivity factors say have increased um, or the, the completion um, statuses have uh, actually surpassed your planning activities. Um, those types of statistics are, are really important in identifying and being able to um, both implement lessons learned um, and also move forward for, for your next implementations to identify things that worked and things that didn't. Uh, tracking metrics is, uh, is a huge aspect where we often do it from a productivity and performance basis, uh, but we need to bring it into an overall AWP basis also. Even if it's just the AWP department, tracking those activities is paramount. There's lots of great tools out there. O3 is a great tracking tool. Um, there's great tracking tools from DCW and uh, Hexagon and uh, Autodesk as well. Um, those purpose-built tools for tracking um, the AWP metrics um, are, are key to give you that visibility, not just into um, your plan, but into exactly how your, your program is executing. Um, we talk about AWP and giving you visibility and predictability into your AWP environment into your planned environment uh, well your metrics are going to give you that visibility into the actual activities occurring within the uh, the production of your uh, your awp program and your iwps themselves <clears throat> all right so from a point of view of learning about metrics uh, awp 406 uh, from the from the university is a great great program to help you bring forward and understand um, exactly how to and what metrics you should be looking at um, one of our flagship type metrics, if you will, is pictured on the screen here, which is a triple stack bar graph, um, which is basically identifying your burn rates against your production rate and your, your constrained and, uh, and actual planned um, efforts within your, your department. So your production against, uh, against burn and whether packages can actually be executed or not. Some of the most important metrics that uh, you're going to need when implementing AWP. 
All right, <clears throat> so let's look at number six. Fail to integrate how we do business. Now, a lot of people um, look at AWP as a, a new methodology or look at it as an alternative methodology. The truth is, is that AWP over quite some time has been designed as an integration into um, how we typically do business in our organizations today. Most people, you'll hear the term, well, we've kind of done that for a long time, or we've done aspects of that for quite some time. Um, and I think that uh, we've got a pretty good handle on it, those types, of, those types of things. Well, the truth is when we start looking at how organizations do business, most organizations have great uh, flow charts that look like this as to how they integrate and execute a project. AWP does have certain milestones, certain requirements. Uh, pictured on the screen here is the flow charts um, that were originally drafted by COA um, and became part of CII also many, many years ago in the early development of the model. Uh, back around 2000, 2010, 2011, these were drafted. Uh, great tools uh, for helping to identify um, what's required of AWP, but also how to integrate it into your own organization. Um, and integrating into your organization is, is kind of a key aspect. Um, AWP 504 within the AWP University um, is a great course teaching you about process overlay development. Uh, you notice on the bottom of that screen of that laptop, that's a very detailed uh, process over or process drawing in general, but it's a process overlay identifying um, how AWP in this organization and the touch points of AWP in this organization are brought forward. Each of the blue lines is major POC milestone events, um, so path of construction milestone events, um, and tracking that, tracking your, your touch points and how AWP needs to be integrated uh, into your organization is key. Um, a lot of times people start working forward and they start thinking, okay, well, we're gonna change how we execute a project, we're gonna bring AWP in, we're gonna execute AWP and that's our new baseline. A um, Couple things happen with that. First off, um, you lose sight of maybe some of the things that your organization has been doing well for quite a long time. Um, the other thing that occurs is uh, certain individuals who are used to working in certain, certain methods um, can become alienated very quickly. When the truth is, is that AWP is a methodology that's designed to be integrated into how you do business today. Um, taking a look and going through your swim lane flow charts for how you execute a project, overlaying the AWP methodologies on top of that is a real key activity in being successful with your AWP implementations. And if you're brand new to it, um, sometimes it's a matter of phasing into your overlay as well, making sure that you don't bombard with so much change that it's uh, you get a change shock scenario um, and that uh, the whole program could uh, could be in danger. So <clears throat> understanding how you do business today and where you wanna get to in your AWP journey and creating those overlays um, is a key aspect that's often overlooked in a project implementation um, and is very key to uh, ensure that you're successful. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at number five. Uh, fail to use interactive planning for POC development. This is a very common one. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion uh, during this, uh, this conference about the path of construction. Uh, Frankie from uh, AWP Insight gave a great um, explanation of the basics of path of construction development on the first day. Um, had some great insight, uh, very, very smart dude. Um, there's a lot of great things that we can say about path of construction development, but there's digging deep into how it actually happens and failing to use interactive planning in that POC development can have uh, some detrimental effects, if you will. Making sure that you know, you're getting the right people in the room, you're starting to do the planning, whether you're doing the old school sticky notes, um, everybody in a room style planning, or this example on the on the wall here actually comes from a tool called V Planner um, that we've used in co consultation with several organizations before in path of construction development. Uh, basically, digital struct sticky notes, great tool for bringing that forward. Identifying how um, it is that you integrate um, the path of construction and how it works for your organization 
uh, makes a huge difference to, to give you that, that benefit of the path of construction, making sure you get the right people in the room, as Frankie was mentioning before, um, but also in understanding how that integration needs to occur um, into your organization across the, the multiple areas, making sure those right people, right time, the best discussions are happening, and that you're, you've really brought your path of construction development forward. Now, Frank, you mentioned that you know, the path of construction needs to be developed once, um, which is true. Um, you do start with a baseline of your path of construction, but the path of construction over the development of the project, and as new data comes forward, uh, becomes more of a real uh, accordion type model. If you're familiar with this type of, a, uh, of an accordion model, basically what it's saying is that when we, we do our initial path of construction development, we've got our baseline. Um, we now have that, that one time where we've created the, the, uh, the path of construction, but you know what? That path of construction is gonna need tweaks. It's gonna need uh, further information added to it. It's gonna need some evolution as the project continues, as we go through detailed engineering, as we get the dreaded vendor data into the system, our procurement plans start getting into place. So basically what this accordion model is showing us is that we all get together, we start to baseline that initial path of construction, we start developing it, getting into a great place, we've got it basically laid out. Then based on um, our each individual tasks and requirements, going away, continuing to evolve that, making sure that we're still having some interaction between it, but we're we're off doing the, the activities that we need to continue to further um, the path of construction development, the path of construction refinement, um, then getting back together to, to share those ideas and ensure um, that any evolution that's required continues. Um, and this accordion model often follows along a clear path that describes how um, a project starts to evolve in its work packaging journey. So when you start early in the beginning, of course, you're identifying your initial business need. Once that initial business need is designed, is developed, you start getting into your early FEL stages. And those early FEL stages, we're looking at defining the path of construction. And that's really, you know, if you sat in on that session with Frankie, he gave a great explanation of how you're defining um, that path of construction here. But then you need to continue with it. Obviously, once we've defined it, um, we've kind of put our, our fork in it and said, okay, this is how we want to execute. Our best laid plans are not always the plans that we're going to go forward with. Um, so we continue to do a refinement and then finalize, and then we actually follow that path of construction. But as you see this model um, that I have brought up on the screen here for the development of them, early on in the path of construction planning, you're gonna be working with basic CWAs and identifying your contracting strategies and bringing those types of things forward to start with. Then as your project gets further into project definition and you're starting to get more into your detailed engineering basis, you're now starting to break it down into your C the CWAs and the CWPs. And from those CWPs, you're getting your EWPs and PWPs. A lot of acronyms are thrown at you. I apologize, but we love acronyms in AWP. Um, as our, we always refer to our process in an acronym form. Uh, but your construction work packages, breaking them down into your engineering work packages and your procurement work packages or using your procurement work process, um, whatever uh, uh, basis you, you assign yourself to that way. Um, and you're refining that path of construction. It's an iterative process where you're getting more detailed. Then we start getting into finalizing it where um, we've got acceptance. We now have further information. Our procurement information has evolved. Our vendor data is now um, brought in. That's given us some ideas of some of our constraints. So we've now maneuvered and changed our plan and our priorities based on um, the data that's come in. Standard project type ecosystem, but now you see how it's tied to the package development and the basis of the refinement of the path of construction as you go through. So building the initial path of construction, refining it, finalizing it. And once we finalize it, then of course we're moving into contracting based on it and our IWP development. And this contract that's for field execution contracting. IWPs as they're developed, moving them forward and then into site execution, of course, turnover. Um, but this basic model, really important. A lot of um, organizations fail to start to get the right people in the room using this accordion type interactive planning methodology where you're starting to get everybody into the room at the right time. 
they're going away, they're doing the tasks that are required to satisfy and support that path of construction, and then coming back and reporting and feeding into any refinements necessary, whether it's an acceptance or it's minor changes, or maybe God forbid there's been major changes and it's a rebaselining um, that could happen. Um, being able to support that project schedule based on the path of construction development um, is key and utilizing an interactive planning model makes it much easier to follow this type of a refine or a define, refine and finalize uh, type model for your path of construction development and execution. Um, again, uh, we've got two classes on this in the university. AWP 302 takes you through interactive planning activities um, and AWP 303 takes you through actual path of construction development. In these courses, take you right through in even how to facilitate the actual sessions, who should be in those sessions, um, you know, how should the model be brought up, a 3D environment to, to help in the aiding of the planning, uh, making sure you got some scheduling forward, those types, of, those types of things, ensuring the right people are in the right room and that you're, you're, you're achieving a certain level of, uh, of integration in the planning activities through the whole, the whole aspect and teaching in a little bit more detail about that plan, uh, ref, define, refine uh, process, as well as the uh, uh, integrated planning sessions and that accordion, accordion model, driving those forward to, to be synonymous to give you a, a real true refined path of construction. All right, so, Next, number four, identify AWP fundamentals as training as AWP fundamentals training as good enough. Um, often in our organization, and this may come across as a little bit of uh, um, self promotion, if you will, but the truth is, is that proper training for our organizations is is key. What often happens is we get into um, the heat of battle. Um, we take a basic overview type training. We've got you know couple days with the training or we've taken four hours of overview with the vendor and now we understand how to spell AWP. Um, well, basic fundamentals gives you the, the grassroots, but then you need to take it forward to understand more um, from the fundamentals and take it forward. So I'll take the opportunity for a little bit just to show you about the structure um, of the AWP University and how we take you beyond uh, just the initial fundamentals. Um, you know, that, that real crawl, walk, run uh, type basis. We live by it. Um, AWP Fundamentals, great course. Uh, many different vendors have them. Uh, they're important to give you a great baseline and a, and a way to move forward. Um, but those basics of AWP is going to, like I say, allow you to spell it. Um, but when you get into the implementation and understanding who needs to do what, that's when you got to get a little bit more detailed with your program. So, in the university, we start with um, AWP fundamentals. Um, these are some snapshots from our website so that you can see from the LMS system itself. Um, we have three basic areas in the first level one, which is the AWP fundamentals. We do an intermediate certification for work-face planning and then engineering, uh, bringing engineers uh, forward into the AWP fold. Um, so these are the basic places where you start. And as we were stating, a lot of organizations kind of stop here um, when this is the beginning uh, to the AWP learning journey, um, if you will, and how we've brought it forward within the university is taking some bite sizes at it, some bites at it, right? So first, taking your introductory type training. These are two-day training sessions. It uh, gives you a great foundation, a good understanding. Um, you know what is to be expected, but when you really need to learn the details, then we get into our specific modules. We've got 64 different modules within the university. Um, and what we do with those modules, right from you know introductory, our full role-based training series, the best practice series, um, our specialty training and advanced techniques. Um, the advanced techniques is really, when we go through certain sessions, certain times we need to bring out um, and give a lot more detail around certain areas, such things as um, one of the courses there is P6, uh, schedule development. We don't teach you how to use P6, but we what we do is identify how a WBS structure needs to be developed. Um, the templates need to be developed for um, a P6 implementation. How AWP needs to integrate into your schedules to be very friendly. 
Uh, those types of things are extremely important in developing a system that's going to be very beneficial moving forward. That's You're not going to fight yourself. Um, so those types of trainings to continue to move forward in your learnings beyond your basic fundamentals is key. Now, we've got 64 modules. We don't expect anybody to take all 64. So what we've done is we've driven them forward into very clear learning paths. So based on the project environment, the project duties that you're going to be um, executing or the project duties that you maybe are aspiring to, um, and that's why you're taking the, the learning initiatives. Uh, we break those 64 modules into certain specific learning paths that give very clear learning objectives, uh, both from a level two and a level three uh, basis for each of these specific roles. So truly really teaching the student what it is they need to do, what their responsibilities are, uh, within AWP, we feel is very key. Um, if all you do is bombard people um, and get them, hit them with a fire hose worth of learning, um, your students are going to go away from that or your employees are going to go away from those types of sessions going, oh, that was awesome. I know how AWP is supposed to be implemented, but I get no idea what I'm supposed to do or where to start. Um, the basis of taking our 64 modules and breaking them into just the modules that individuals need to learn and in the right order uh, from a true learning path um, is key to continuing education within AWP and ensuring um, that there is a true learning environment. Often um, owners or contractors will, will supply a fundamentals type basis, that basic one, two day type training that we were talking about. Um, that's a great place to get your feet wet, but you really need to get into an area um, where you start doing role-based training and, and training your organization on the specifics of what those tasks are. Um, otherwise, it's going to be a school of hard knocks and at, at the expense of the project, people are going to be learning where, um, you know, there's several different educational providers that, that do this type of training and the university is one of them. Um, and it's a it's an aspect that's often overlooked uh, within an organization and uh, um, definitely wanted to bring that forward to continue the learnings. Um, helping to aid with some of those bad habits also, if you will. Um, we've learned a lot over the past 15 to 20 years of development of the AWP models. And uh, a lot of those learnings and furtherments are, are into our modules here. Um, we've expanded well beyond uh, the basis of the COA and CII models that, uh, that myself and my colleagues have helped to develop over the, the last uh, many decades, last couple decades. Um, and help to evolve and interpret that within the, the materials um, of the university. All right, so that was a little self-serving, but let's move forward and continue down our list of things organizations tend to overlook or make mistakes with. Um, and trying to give you a few basic tools and a shopping list of things that would be great to, to look at and make sure that you don't fall into some of these pitfalls. So number three, they don't integrate engineering into AWP for the project. A lot of times this, this, this really does still happen where um, engineering is, is still that completely independent capsule um, um, off, on a, off in a distant world and they're reporting how they always have. Maybe contracting hasn't been changed at all. Their restor re reporting structures are still just based on the drawing production, as many drawings as they can produce and as fast as they can produce, doesn't matter which ones are the right ones or when we need them, um, those types of scenarios. Um, and coming from an engineering background and previous to that, from a trades background, um, having walked both sides of the, the fence, both from a receiving of engineering and a production of engineering information, um, the integration of those departments, even if they're a contractor or a value engineering house that's very, separated or three or four degrees separated from the field, um, integrating the AWP methodologies into how engineering does business um, is very key. Making sure that there is an understanding of how the EWP, um, that engineering work package, that engineering deliverable to satisfy advanced work packaging requirements integrates with multiple other packages, showing its relationship. Um, you know, from this drawing, being able to identify um, interfacing scopes so that we know what the dependencies are, what some of the con some of the constraints are associated with them. Understanding in that EWP what actually needs to be contained 
uh, within the EWP drawings, specifications, uh, the engineering analyses, material requirements, uh, vendor data. That's always a big one that, that tends to, uh, we like to complain about it a lot, but uh, it is what it is on the basis of when it can be developed um, and the information that we need from it to, to further some of our other uh, developments. In around a lot of these types of areas is where we start making discuss decisions within engineering. Um, you know, vendors need time to engineer, so we need to, on a heavy fast track type organization, maybe we need to bring forward um, a, a basis where we're accepting some heavier costs up front to ensure that we can move forward. And what I mean by that is maybe we do 10, 15 percent over engineering of a foundation for any variances that are going to happen um, in the vendors engineering and deliverables. This is a, a common thing. Um, and a common acceptance of, uh, of cost to mitigate risk um, to ensure that our EWPs get to the field um, and can be executed or that we can start to produce the information even before we've got maybe all the things that we need fully identified before true construction can occur, uh, but allowing uh, development to, to continue. The construction requirements identified with it, turnover requirements, of course, starting with the end in mind, making sure that our packages facilitate how we're going to be turning things over. The <clears throat> external in, uh, engineering interfacing um, tied to the EWPs, making sure that that's all brought forward. Maybe, you're, maybe that's vendor data. Um, maybe that is a value engineering house and there's a certain portion of the plant or the facility that's being engineered externally. Um, those implications need to be brought in as to, to how they tie into the EWP as well. Uh, your turnover packages and your turnover plan, how it is that the, the owner actually wants this thing uh, turned over and what, what, what does it actually look like to be successful for the delivery of this project, um, making sure that those help guide both our EWP formation and uh, our EWP schedule. We often start looking at engineering a little differently these days, uh, where once upon a time, it was all about drawing production, um, isometric issuance, erection drawing issuance. We didn't seem to, to matter whether it was the right ones, just that there was a number getting, getting issued and out the door. Um, I know I've been part of engineering departments where production, was, production numbers was the key, not necessarily the right numbers being key, um, and bringing forward this EWP type method, um, something today that we like to call a path of engineering, um, much like we talk about a path of construction, ensuring that that path of construction ties into the path of engineering and that those two are integrated so that when we look at it, we can actually say that our engineering department is delivering and going to be facilitating uh, based on our construction execution schedule and vice versa. Um, we used to use the term construction driven engineering. Um, I don't believe that's an apt term um, because the EWP and the path of engineering has its own criteria that it, obviously that needs to be considered as well. It's an integrated interactive planning activity where the path of construction and the path of engineering need to be integrated together so that there's a symbiotic relationship between the two so that we're getting the information in the field when we need it. Engineering has the time to produce the information as required and they're producing in a manner that suits their proper production as well as suits the, the field production. From those EWPs, we're then obviously creating procurement requirements on um, procurement work packages and, the, and identifying the POs. So you can start to see that the integration of engineering into the health of an AWP program is very key. Lots of programs that have been initiated, I said, okay, maybe, maybe on our third or fourth project, we'll start to tackle uh, what engineering is doing a little bit more. Um, and, and in a slow walking in a environment, um, that can work. But to become truly functional uh, within AWP, we need to really start looking at how we integrate our engineering deliverable program uh, into the whole AW, AWP philosophy um, and making, making sure that we're all doing that interactive planning and, and working in the same direction uh, to bring it forward in a, a positive manner. All right, so um, engineering level one certificate. Uh, we're actually, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, we're actually going to be delivering a course in the UK time zone uh, Thursday, Friday, 
of next week, uh, 29th and 30th, I believe the dates are. Um, it's a great course to help you get off the ground, understanding the basis of AWP. We go through a day of just AWP um, basics, um, and then a day of basically engineering tied to those AWP basics, teaching you about engineering development, right down to engineering model requirements. So what attribution may be a little bit different uh, to help streamline the data, um, teaching you about digital threads. What is a digital thread? How do you develop digital threads? What is the, the uh, template for a digital thread and the documentation actually need to look like so that it can be documented properly and, and re-executed and, and multiplied in the project environment? Um, how does engineering need to support AWP and how does AWP need to support engineering? Uh, both of those aspects, uh, very important. This jumpstart, this two-day session really gets you off the ground um, to understand from an engineering point of view what you need to do to, to satisfy that, uh, that development within the, uh, the engineering department um, in an AWP environment. All right, so next one. Let's look at number two, fail to make changes to project controls to integrate AWP. Kind of touched on this one a little bit earlier. Um, it's another one that's very similar to what we were talking about with engineering. We see this often where we haven't looked at the project controls environment. We may have done an AWP as an overlay um, where we've looked at, and what I mean by just as an overlay, where we haven't truly integrated it. We haven't integrated the touch points um, over the, we've got different departments going forward and they're kind of like, well, the AWP guys over there, they're, they're doing some stuff, they're planning. We're not exactly sure exactly what's happening over there, but uh, we're just going to continue business as usual over here moving forward. Often it is very much or very close to business as usual, but there are some changes that are requirement required and integrating project controls into those, um, is very important. And let's look at some of those aspects. So activity coding is probably one of the first things that we need to start talking about with project controls. Um, what our nomenclature looks like, what the WBS structure looks like, what our cost codes look like. Uh, if we got cost codes that don't help us to facilitate how we plan to break down the data, because remember at the end of the day, when we're talking about AWP, it's all about data. It's all about how we're breaking that data down into consumable bite-sized pieces. Our lean community loves to use the example of the elephant, um, those types of things. It's all very, very relevant. We need to break down large amounts of data into smaller consumable pieces. Um, and our activity coding, activity structures, our cost coding structures, those are all very, very important to ensure that, that we can actually control them as we break them down. Um, often we see it where the, the coding structures have not been changed or affected or modified to actually work well um, within an AWP environment. And you find that there's really a tug of war between the way the field is executing, the way deliverables are being produced and the way we're recording it and the way we're tracking it. Um, and that can give you very poor or incorrect uh, results. Uh, you know, using tools um, for AWP, you know, maybe it's an O3 type control system, which is going to give you great visibility into executing um, in the AWP environment, tying that into the project control. So that data that you're mining, that data that you're using to control um, AWP is prevalent within project controls. It's not on a different island. It's not in a different area. Um, it's all going in the same direction, paddling the same direction, if you will, uh, bringing those forward. Tracking by CWPs, that's often one of the areas where when we're bringing project controls forward, we kind of forget. Um, we go forward with the way we've always done progress, the way we've always grouped things uh, within project controls, and then we end up trying to convert things um, through lookup tables and all kinds of other things to both report progress and track um, how we're actually executing things um, by CWP. So having an actual persistence in an entity within our project controls environments that are that are aligned with our work packaging strategies, such as CWPs, EWPs, IWPs within the project controls, um, helps us to streamline the information transfer between our different departments. So let's not forget about uh, the project controls environments. Once we get those aligned, there's all kinds of benefits that we get from being truly aligned with project controls. Our 4D, our 5D, the XD, being able to identify and bring forward how things are done 
um, and how we can start to move it forward and analyze whether it can be done that way. Um, I like to say that just a basic 4D is gonna teach you about the requirements of gravity. And what does that mean? It's often one of the very first things that we notice in a 4D simulation um, is that gravity's king. And it sounds really funny to say it, but in a 2D environment, 2D planning environment, when everything's on a spreadsheet and flattened out, it's very difficult to see that maybe that module that we're, that we're planning to do on a certain date can't be done on that date because the actual module underneath it needs to be installed first. Sounds really funny to say it out loud like that, but it's amazing how many schedules have those kinds of disconnects where we are, you know, requiring sky hooks and those types of things to actually be able to install components because the, the basic considerations of gravity haven't taken place. A 4D simulation um, gives you those types of uh, visibilities into it, as well as start moving into the 5D and XD, um, bringing the schedule into it and cost into it to identify what the cost implications are going to be at certain, certain levels. Implementing, implementing CWP release plans into how it is that uh, um, con Project Controls is going to be looking for progress, um, how the schedule has been produced, how that WBS structure has been affected uh, from a packaging basis, basis, showing the CWAs and the CWPs within the schedule. Um, however, however you break down your project, if you're using sub CWPs or sub CWAs, I don't want to necessarily open up that that uh, that bee's nest right now, but there's very good cases for where we need further um, breakdowns on some larger projects and some more complex projects where we do sub CWAs and sub CWPs. Um, sometimes you do require larger numbers of of packages to be able to effectively break it down. Um, there's an activity in in um, in workface planning and and AWP that teaches you how to get to the appropriate. Um, level of package breakdown versus just breaking down packages because you, you think you need it. Uh, too many packages can be detrimental. Not enough can also be detrimental. Um, so right sizing things is key. Integrating that with project controls is going to give you some of that visibility that's very, uh, very key in making sure that your projects are successful. Um, I rate this very high on the list because, can, you know, when we start talking about true engineering integration, but just that we were talking about just before this, and then start talking about project controls integration into our AWP environments. It's often how we forget about that aspect. And I, su I s highly suggest to promote, you start looking at tools in the industry that help streamline this heavily. Um, there's a lot of good products out there. Um, you know, one I mentioned O3 a couple times, great tool for, for analytics and tracking um, and seamlessly into project controls and such. Um, take a look at a lot of these things and integrate your project controls. Um, your project environment will love you for it, trust me. All right, so from that basis, teaching about project control support for AWP, we do a role-based training uh, to teach project controls what exactly they need to learn, um, where their responsibilities lie. Um, our role-based training is like those complicated racy matrices that you see on your projects all the time, we, we explain them. We make it very simple for you to understand what the duties are, what the frequency of deliverables are, who you need to deal with, all of those types of, of aspects. Um, when it starts getting into project control support, we talk about WBS structures, we talk about cost coding. Uh, we bring that forward as to how all those things need to be looked at and integrated. Um, and when you start looking at courses like this, you can understand how maybe that initial fundamentals is great for getting your feet wet, but you need to start moving into these role bases, role based training so that you can get that real true leg up on, on how to integrate these departments like we were just talking about with engineering or project controls, how, how all that works. Being able to learn from the lessons of others um, is a true sign of intelligence. You know, learning yourself is not always, um, make, through the school of hard knocks is not always the most effective and efficient. Um, learning from those that have been there, done that, made the mistakes and, and know not to make them again is often um, your, your key to success. Um, and when we start talking about integrating groups, integrating other dependencies um, and other, other groups that are dependent, such as project controls on the information that we produce from construction and other, um, extremely important for success of the AWP program, as well as the project ecosystem in general. All right, so we'll look at number one, don't incorporate role-based training. We talked about that a little bit in the last one. I just gave a bit of a breakdown of it, gave you a little bit of a 
early glimpse into the number one issue um, that a lot of organizations have when implementing AWP. Um, this, is, this is a very real thing um, on a lot of organizations. They go through training, they go, they've got an idea of how they wanna implement. Um, and then unfortunately, when it really comes down to the independent departments, they really don't know um, what they're supposed to do to support, you know, from a data point of view, those digital threads. That's the equivalent of role-based training for data. Um, you know, digital thread management, what do different systems have to produce and how do they talk to each other? What data is transferred? How often is it transferred? What form does it take? Um, that, that's, that's basic role-based training for our data. Uh, we need to do that for our departments and our organizations and our individuals as well so that they understand who they need to talk to, what they need to produce, how often they need to produce it, what it needs to look like, what our templates need to look like for it. Uh, those types of things all come into uh, role-based training and whether it, whether you call it true role-based training or on-the-job um, details or there's multiple other different uh, ways to look at it, you need to, to look at bringing those types of things into the organization so that the individual gets that coaching so that they understand what needs to be done. You know, beware of that dreaded single bucket overview. Um, often we look at our training programs and we bring them forward onto organizations and Okay, we got two weeks AWP or two days of AWP training. That's all we need. We got this great awareness training. It's good to get your feet wet, as I've said multiple times, but it doesn't teach the individual, <clears throat> excuse me, what their tasks need to be. They should be broken down into easily consume modules so that you can start to identify from a single point of view. Don't drink from the fire hose. Um, I love this picture. Um, you know, that's that's what training can be for certain individuals. Um, you know, you don't need to teach a workspace planner about how to integrate a WBS structure into their project controls environment. They need to know that a, that project controls is doing that, but project controls needs to be trained on how that happens. Um, you know, right sizing your, your training, ensuring that role-based training comes forward is very key to not overwhelming the, your project participants, not making them drink from that fire hose. Um, and I was a fireman once upon a time. I'm a retired fireman now. Uh, nine years I spent on the hose, and uh, that's not something you want to do, drinking from the fire hose. Um, and that's what it can be like on a project when you start getting into AWP learnings, um, if it's not targeted to the individual. So finally, on, on this aspect, you know, don't crush the will of the student by overwhelming them. Uh, that's a very key aspect. When we start looking at how we bring training forward, we need to consider the needs of the student as we move it forward. So in the, in the university, we've got multiple different modules, everything from you know, the AWP coordinator itself to teaching about access coordination and how you bring forward uh, the requirements of that uh, access training um, and everything in between, construction management, workface planning, workface planning coordinator specific to those, those roles and then building the work paths around, or the learning paths around them is key. Um, so role-based training, that is, that is key to success, I truly believe, on an organization, bringing people forward that know who they're to interact with and what they're to produce is very key. So, you know, that's our Series 200 training, that role-based training aspect and bringing it forward is, is important. So um, as we come to the end, um, and we've got our number one, so, you know, AWP education requirements today, um, it's obviously a little bit different world. Uh, this thing called COVID has kind of stood things on its ear a bit and obviously changed the way we do business. Um, you know, technology has come a long ways when it comes to online learning activities. Online learning has become a very recognized methodology. Um, ourselves, even with the AWP University, I mean, I've been training in AWP now going on 15 years. I've been all over the world training multiple different organizations, but only just recently. Uh, due to this changing world, have we gone to a true online LMS system moving forward uh, to, to bring forward this type of training into environments that we you might not have been able to access due to uh, the this, this situations the world's going through right now with uh, COVID and, and other. All right, so uh, thank you for, for sitting with me. Um, again, I'm Rob Mickelson with the AWP University. Um, if you want to go check out our, our website and our LMS system, scan the QR code on the screen. That'll take you through. Um, I'd love to open it up to some questions now. We've got about five, ten minutes left. A um, bit informed we can um, go through a few questions here um, at the end. So I welcome them. I will open up your mics. Um, so I will 
There we go. So everybody now has the ability to unmute themselves. Um, I would suggest um, on the left-hand side of your screen in your control panel, there is a little hand. Uh, if you click on the raised hand function, that'll give you the ability to, to indicate that you're raising your hand to ask a question. I'd love to, love to field a few questions now. Um, so go ahead. Anybody um, got a couple questions on some of the top 10 things or experiences that you've had within your planning organizations that you want to share with the greater group? Not sure what's going on, Mandy. I know that uh, uh, it's showing as unmuted, but uh, you'll have to click on your on your mute button to, to be able to speak to us. Um, that's a shame. I was looking forward to hearing from you. Um, anybody else would like to uh, um, add or, or make a comment? I welcome any questions at this point. All right, excellent. So, um, we can also type any questions into the question panel, uh, if that'd be easier, if, uh, if you don't speak in person. Um, and uh, beyond this, you can come also see me at the virtual booth um, and contact or ask any questions that way as well. Or uh, based on the, the slide that's on the screen right now, you can see that my email address is robin at awpu-u.com, um, awp um, or we also have a general um, inquiry basis of info at awp-u.com um, that you can send and any of our consultants will, will capture that. Um, so please feel free to email me. I'm always uh, happy to answer questions in the industry. And uh, thank you very much for your time here. We're hitting right on the end of the hour. Um, so again, thanks. And we'll uh, conclude the session. I hope that that's, that was helpful. Um, and that uh, maybe that'll help you avoid some of the, the 10 big issues that we often see um, when consulting on different projects and problems that uh, organizations have while implementing AWP. All right, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for joining.